My name is Troy Coburn. I am a very amateur fly tire. <laughs> um, I, I came up with this bug. It took me about two years to come up with it. Uh, a lot of trial and error, and this is actually the fourth generation of this bug. Um, over a couple years, I kept coming into um, problems and issues with the bug that I wanted to fix, and I would make a fix and take it back out, use it, come up with another problem, and I, I think I finally got this thing dialed in. So anyway, I, I, I like I call this the uh, the one inch death punch, and uh, the name has a lot of meaning in it. But um, for the sake of not burning a two hour video, we'll just leave it at that. So anyway, I'm going to start with a I'm going to start with an Umqua. Uh, this is a size eight. It's a model C four hundred BL barbless jig hook. Uh, jig hooks are probably the uh, the biggest rage in, in fly tying right now and uh, there's a good reason for that. Um, there's a lot of advantage to using a, a, a jig style hook. Uh, number one is you can actually jig the fly and keep the hook point up which um, for me I, I get better hook sets and I also get a lot less snags um, because the, the natural position of the jig hook riding hook point up tends to stay off the rocks on the bottom and it also tends to come over uh, wood and, and timber a little bit better. It has more of a gliding action when it slides over the top rather than that hook point being down and digging in. And we all know brown trout really like to hang around wood. So I fish around wood quite a bit and this reduces my hangups quite a bit. So basically I'm just going to start with the hook like this. And I'm going to start with some thread. And I'm just going to kind of bulk up the thread on the front of the hook on the part that bends up towards the eye. And this actually serves a purpose. I'm just going to do a quick whip finish, tie it off, I'm going to cut my thread off, and I'm going to put my bead on. This is a a four millimeter a uh, slotted black nickel tungsten bead and I really like the tungsten uh, because it's heavy and it gets it down quick and it's pretty important for this fly to be fished on or near the bottom. So basically what I'll do is the reason I put that thread on there I've got the the, the Loon UV flow and I'll just Put a little drop of the flow down in that slot on the bead. I'm going to let it soak into that thread for a second. I'm going to hit it with my UV light. And so the purpose of that thread is just to lock that bead into place so that it's not wiggling around while I'm trying to tie it. It becomes kind of a pain in the rear end if that thing's moving around constantly. So now that bead is, is locked into place and I don't have to worry about it moving around. So I'm going to put my hook back into place. I'm going to come back in with my thread and I'm going to lay down my base. And I'm going to run that, that base all the way up the bend of the hook. like so. And then after I come around the bend of the hook, I'm actually going to build a little bump. Not much of one, just one like that. Come back down, I'm going to start a dubbing loop. Bring that thread all the way back to the front. Now the reason I build that little bump is because in a couple minutes I'm going to put a um, a squirrel, uh, a piece of squirrel fur on there, um, a zonker. And what that little bump is going to do is it's going to prevent that, that squirrel zonker from continuing to slide down and start interfering with the dubbing and, and then it's not straight and so it kind of has a weird angle to it. So that bump just kind of helps keep everything straight. So now I'm going to do a mixture of a couple different dubbings. 
Now, this is the Senyo's, Senyo's Laser Dub. I live and die by this stuff. It's the greatest stuff since sliced bread. And I'll tell you why I like it so much. It is because most synthetic dubbing I have found is very slick. And you have a really hard time getting it to stay in a dubbing loop. Unless you really grease it up with a lot of wax. And I absolutely hate wax unless I absolutely have to use it. And then this Ice Dub does not stay in your dubbing loop very well. So this Senyo's serves a couple purposes, and I usually do about 50% of each. Um, number one, it acts as a gripping agent for um, the, the dubbing loop. And I'm just gonna blend this in like this. And um, number two, it, it kind of tones down the, the ice dub. I'm not a big fan of really bright shiny flies most of the time. There's nothing in nature that for the most part is bright and shiny that the fish eat. Um, you know, minnows, bait fish, they're camouflaged for a reason because if they're not camouflaged they go extinct. Um, they're, they're easy targets and so fish, my philosophy on on this stuff is fish aren't used to seeing really bright and shiny things all the time. I'm not saying they won't react to bright and shiny stuff, but the older, bigger fish tend to be a little wiser, and those are the fish I'm fishing for most of the time. Those are the fish I want to appeal to. So I like to tone this down. So by adding the, la the Senyo's Laser Dub, I get better grip in my dubbing loop, and it tones down the, the UV um, um, ice dub a little bit. So now I've got it blended in pretty well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab one end of it and I'm going to start pulling and then replacing, pulling, replacing. I want it all to kind of be the same length. So I'm going to work it so it's all about the same length. And that's close enough. And then I'm going to cut this in half. So now I have a, a, a blunt end right here. And I, I like to start, I'm going to move this bobbin out of the way for a second. I like to start with that blunt end. It just keeps everything nice and neat. I'm going to slide that blunt end up in there like that. And then I'm going to trim that. And now I have another blunt end from just cutting it. So I'm going to do the same thing again. Slide that up. Trim it again. And then one more time with that final piece. So you see how the long tentacles of the dubbing come off on one side and it's blunt on the other. I don't like the body of my fly, and I'm doing this to build the body of the fly. I don't like the body of the fly being all messy looking. I want it to be pretty compact. And so by trimming off those longer pieces, what I end up getting is a very compact uh, body. So I'm going to pinch that off. And just spin it. And so now you can see in that body, that dubbing loop, I don't have a whole lot of scraggly looking long pieces that, that, that come off and go every which direction. It's pretty compact, which is exactly what I'm wanting to achieve. Get that out of the way. And then I'm just going to wrap it almost to the front. Now as I wrap, I like to pull back those fibers so that I'm not trapping a lot of fibers underneath the wrap. I get a little more a little more bulk that way. Just keep pulling those fibers back. Nice tight wraps. I don't want to go all the way to the front. And I'll show you why in just a second. Okay. Trap that. Okay, now you can see I left a little bit of a, I guess like a little neck right there in between the bead. 
trap it one more time. Just capture that dubbing loop. And I'm going to pull everything back and I'm going to give myself kind of a collar right there. I'm going to go back and forth a few times. And what this collar does for me is it gives me a platform like a foundation to attach my um, my squirrel zonker. So if you try to set that squirrel zonker on top of a, on top of the dubbing and then tie it in, it doesn't anchor as well and then a lot of times that'll eventually work its way uh, loose and I don't I don't want that to happen. I try to build my flies to last. I've I've got a few of these that I've caught gosh probably 30 or 40 fish on and they still they still fish and it's just because of the construction I believe I put that little bit of extra effort into it all right so now we've got um, squirrel zonkers these are not the micros um, these are just the regular size squirrel zonker um, I don't like using micros when I'm tying a, a pattern that imitates a minnow just because I want it to stand out a little bit I want it to be kind of bulky I want it to move a lot of water but I'm sure there's a time and a place for the micros this is just typically not it and so I want probably about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half and I always like to go a little bit longer than what I need because I can always trim it but if it's not there I can't add it I'll trim off a little piece like this and that's going to be my body of the fly or my uh, tail of the fly that's going to give me uh, a lot of action these squirrel zonkers react to microcurrents in the in the water they move a lot without you having to impart a lot of action on them and I really like that and it also gives me a tapered look so I'm going to have a big bulky body and then it's going to taper to the end of the tail and that's very that torpedo shape is what I'm trying to achieve because that's what most bait fish look like now in this particular color this is olive you can see that the 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 actual skin the hide is actually more like a chartreuse and I don't like that so I've got some pens um, just some permanent markers Prismacolor and Sharpie and what I like to do is just kind of give that hide a mottled appearance. So I just kind of like do little dots of the green down the hide. And then I'll follow it up with little dots of the brown. And this is part of the overthinking that I <laughs> am notorious for when creating a a fly or whatever I always overthink everything and I probably put way too much effort into it but you know what it's about not necessarily the what the fly looks like it's about my confidence level and if my confidence level if this helps my confidence level guess what it's gonna help me catch fish so now you can see that that strip is more of a natural color rather than that kind of a chartreuse color it doesn't stand out so I'm gonna measure up my zonker and I'm gonna impale it on that hook and I'm going to kind of see where I want it to be impaled right about there pull it off pull that hide around the bend and then reattach I'm going to kind of snug it down against that bump that I made in the thread a few minutes ago I'm going to pull some of this fur off of the front because it'll just make it a lot more secure when I tie it down. I just want to take a minute and thank Herman Degala for helping me with this video. This is this is good stuff. <laughs> I'm so excited about this. So thanks, Herman. <laughs> I appreciate this. A lot of time and effort he's putting into helping me out here. I'm going to pull a little more of that fur off of there. Alright, now I'm just going to pull it kind of snug and I'm going to let that line, that, that thread kind of capture that. I'm going to keep my little tool attached here. I'm going to kind of pull it snug and make sure it's secured on top. I'm going to put some tension on my line and then I'm just going to pop that off. I'm going to pull 
the fur back and then I'm going to give some pretty tight wraps because I want to make sure that that is secure. These wraps are towards the back of that collar I created. They're not up towards the bead yet because I want to slide my scissors in and cut that extra hide off of there. Like that. So I'll leave some of that hide on there because I like to try to fold it over a little bit. It just helps to secure. And I just really want to bury that stuff underneath that, underneath those wraps. I'll probably get a little more of that off of there. Like that. There we go, just really bury that eye under there. Okay, that looks good. All right, so now I'm going to bring my thread to the back of that collar. I'm going to make another dubbing loop. Bring that line back up to the front. I think I'm losing my fly here. Tighten it up a little bit. Open up this dubbing loop right like that. And I once again, move my bobbin out of the way. Okay, now, here's where it gets fun. So I'm going to build a composite dubbing loop here. I'm going to, I'm going to use two materials in it. Um, you can use grizzly marabou. Smaller plumes are optimal. Uh, you don't want real big blooms of marabou because you don't want really long barbs. You want the shorter, uh, kind of more webby barbs uh, for this. Um, also, another thing that works really well for this, and I actually like better, but I don't have the color that I need, is the bugger boo. The key here, cut the tip off and get rid of it. You don't want the tip of the bugger boo. You don't want the very tip of the grizzly marabou because it's it's too stiff. It's it wants to splay out like this rather than kind of flow and breathe. So I cut the tip off and I use about the middle section of the bugger boo or the grizzly marabou to achieve what I'm trying to accomplish here. So, and um, on the grizzly marabou, I mean, gosh, you don't even need... I usually use, if I can find a really good feather, like this one is perfect. A really good feather that's very full. I'll use one. If if I'm if I'm having to use you know smaller feathers that are a little more narrow, and you can see the difference between these two feathers. Um, uh, if I'm using a smaller feather like this, I'll use two. But if you have a feather that looks like that, you only need one. So that's going to be the the top of my composite, and then the bottom of my composite is going to be made of a squirrel zonker. Now. Here's the key to the squirrel zonker. You want a piece that has a ton of under fur. If you can see light through it, it's not thick enough. It will not work for this. So you want a really thick, dense piece. And you will see why when we get to that point. So um, I'm going to show you how I get that fur off of the hide. I'm going to cut off probably about an inch of the hide, maybe a little more than an inch, but an inch and an eighth maybe or so. And this is where it gets a little tricky. I'm going to shove that hide into my clip, but I don't want the fur in the clip. So this takes a little patience. I've had a few times where I've thrown clips across the room because it just won't work. Sometimes it helps to wet it down a little bit too. That is what I'm gonna do. Just put a little water on that hide. It, that hide has some memory, and if you wet it, then it becomes a lot more agreeable. It loses its memory, and then you can manipulate it a little bit easier. I don't like to wet it down too much, so too much water 
and it becomes just as difficult to work with as no water at all. All right, so I got my hide in the clip, and then I'm going to pull that fur out so it stands on end. And when you're pulling it, you got to really kind of squeeze. These are kind of cheapo. They're not the Pedagene clips. I can't afford Pedagene clips. These are the cheap ones. So you just kind of pinch the clip. Otherwise, you pull the hide out and you're going to start all over again. So it's going to look like that. Take the second clip. Pull it out. Release the hide. I got my hide kind of twisted. That's going to be a little challenging. And then you cut the hide off. Make sure you get all of the hide off. Okay, that's perfect. And you always want it up towards the end of the clip. You don't want it in the center. Okay, and, and you'll see why here in just a second. Okay, I'm going to set that aside. I'm going to get a little bit of dubbing wax. And I hate dubbing wax. Oh my god, I hate dubbing wax. Stuff is so sticky. But you got to use it to hold that feather in place. So just a little bit on your fingers. I'm going to run it down. I don't want too much because if you put too much on there, what happens is it starts gooping up your feather and and this stuff is just a nightmare to work with. Rub it off my hands. Can I use this? Yep. Get that stuff off my fingers now because it sticks to everything. This stuff is like super glue. Herman's got to hook me up with a better idea than the high tack. <laughs> stuff is terrible. But it works. It does what it's supposed to do. It just makes a mess. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do in my dubbing loop is I'm going to take that feather. I'm going to shove it in like that. And then I'm going to slowly pull it through. And so the length of the feathers, when I pull it through, I don't want them to go past the length of the body. So you can see that dubbing body that I built. You can see that the feathers are pretty much right in line with that dubbing body. That's what I want. And then I'm going to trim off like that. And I can open my loop because I dubbed it. I put the dubbing wax on it. Slide the clip all the way through. Pull it all the way up. And this is why you want the feather or the the fur to go to the end of the dubbing clip because you want to bump it right up against those feathers. Pull that dubbing loop tight. Pinch it. And this is the fun part. Just slowly spin it. Now, when you spin this, here's another important point. This dubbing loop with the fur, if you can see light through it, you need to keep spinning it. You want that, that under fur that you see under there, you want that to be super, super dense. So I keep spinning it until it gets to that point where it's, now the dubbing loop is almost half the size that it was before. It spun up that much and this under fur is super, super dense. You can't see anything through it. Um, that's very, very important. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to wet my fingers and kind of pull that, that marabou back a little bit, like so, just to get it out of the way. And I'll tell you why I'm doing that here shortly. I'm going to run my thread back to the front, get that out of the way. And I'm going to pull that marabou back as I wrap. Yep, there we go. I stick myself every time and I just did it. Those hooks are so super sharp. Keep pulling that marabou back. Pull it back. Okay, now the marabou is wet and it's backing out of the way. Now I'm going to start wrapping the pine squirrel. I'm going to pull the pine squirrel back. And I'm not trying to get the pine squirrel wet. I don't really want the pine squirrel wet because I don't want it to lay back with the marabou. And the reason is, and this is very important, 
I'm going to end up trimming that pine squirrel off for the most part. I'm going to shape a head with it. And I don't want to cut the marabou. Very important that you don't cut the marabou. The marabou has to stay there. The pine squirrel is going to get trimmed. So because that marabou is wet and pulled back, it's going to stay out of the way while I'm trimming the pine squirrel. Because if you start trimming and you start hitting your, pine, your uh, marabou, you've just defeated the whole purpose of having the marabou on there. All right, so there's the final wrap. I'm going to capture my dubbing loop. I'm going to do a wrap. Try to pull all that pine squirrel out of the way. I'm going to do one more capture of that dubbing loop. A couple more wraps. Really pull that pine squirrel back. I'm going to remove that dubbing loop now. That out of the way. Pull that pine squirrel back, get it out of the way. I'm going to do a couple more wraps and then I'm going to do three whip finishes. Now there's a reason I do three whip finishes. Um, I don't like applying head cement to this fly. For some reason, that pine squirrel, if you hit it with head cement, it is a has a great capillary action and it wants to suck all of that head cement off of your off of your uh, final wraps at the front and then it gets gooped up with head cement and then when the head cement dries then all of a sudden it just it looks crummy it doesn't look good and so I like my flies to look good as well as fish fish well and uh, so to avoid using head cement I usually just do about three whip finishes and like I said I have some of these that I have caught um, you know 50 60 fish on and they still haven't come unwrapped and if they do come unwrapped because you have three whip finishes it's usually the first whip finish that comes unwrapped and then you just trim it off on the water and you've got two more underneath it to stop it from further unwrapping so it's it's a safety net and I'm gonna get my thread out of there I'm gonna clean this up a little bit a couple of these little stragglers okay I'm gonna fluff up that pine squirrel again I'm gonna pinch back here because I want that marabou to stay out of the way and I'm gonna fluff up that pine squirrel just going to go around and really try to get that pine squirrel. This kind of looks like your cowboy leech right now, doesn't it? It Aaron? does. I actually watched that video last night. And get that pine squirrel to all stand up. And then I'm going to come in with my razor scissors and I'm going to lay the scissors on the wrapping at the head of the fly and an angle so I'm not going to lay it flat I want it to be at an angle like this and the reason is is because what I'm trying to achieve when I trim this fur off is I want to achieve a tapered look tapering small front uh, big back it's that torpedo shape that natural shape of a minnow and so if it's if it's flat I'm not achieving that that um, that look, so I'm going to bring my scissors in. I'm going to keep it at an angle. I'm just going to go through and rotate my vise. It usually takes about three times around the fly to get exactly what I want. And then after I go around about three times, then I just go back through and I I clean up everything. And if you leave some of these longer bits of fur. Stop. It's not recorded on here. So we're going to do it. Okay, I just need to. Okay, go ahead. So I'm, I'm, if, you, if you still have some of these longer bits of fur, right, in through here, that's fine. That's no big deal. As long as they're angled back. And there's, there's reasons I do everything in this fly. And I'm going to go through that after I get the fly done here. And everything has a good reason.
At least I think it's a good reason. Okay. Get all that debris off of there from trimming it. Okay, now you can see at the very front of this collar that I have built, there's like an edge right there. And I'm going to just kind of go through and try to trim that edge off that corner just to make it look a little more streamlined. Be careful not to nick your thread with these razor scissors because that'll. That will ruin everything. And that's pretty much it right there. So, here's why I put that collar, that, that squirrel hair collar on the, on the front. I could just, one of my first versions of this fly, I tied the marabou, tied it off, I was done. And it just had marabou all over the front. Problem is, is when that fly hits the bottom, the marabou kind of goes to the forward, goes to the front a little bit. And, um, I, I lose that effect of that tapering look. So the, the squirrel fur head serves two major purposes. One, it keeps all that marabou angled back. And two, it gives me the profile that I, that I desire. Another, another purpose that it serves is it actually bulks up the fly a little bit. And um, if you're fishing early morning, late evening, or if you're fishing off color water, a bulky fly is typically a good thing because it pushes water. It sends more vibrations out and the fish can locate it better. So that's the final product. And I will show you real quick why I even put the marabou in there to begin with. Okay, number one, marabou moves a ton. Um, microcurrents cause that marabou to have this wavy action. And if you ever look at minnows, again, here we go with my overthinking. If you ever look at minnows, they've constantly got their little pectoral fins moving and stuff like that. And you get a lot of that micro movement with, um, with, with that extra little marabou in there. But the other thing is, the beauty th with this fly is it imitates nothing in particular, everything in general. It looks like a minnow. It looks like a sculpin. Uh, it, it looks like a crawdad when you're um, when it's nose down on the bottom with that heavy tungsten bead and this little tail stands up and just kind of moves with the with the water and it also looks like uh, a leech with that uh, with the way that this moves on the back but another big thing that I notice is it looks a lot like a stonefly so um, that marabou when this thing is tumbling along the bottom, you'll see those marabou barbs kick out like this. You can see how those things will stand out and they move and they undulate as this thing is tumbling along the bottom of the river. Okay, and what that looks like is it looks like the stonefly legs kicking out and, and moving as that thing is helplessly tumbling along the bottom. So that's the reason why I put the marabou in there. Uh, I put the, the dubbing in there to give it a little flash. The marabou helps to cover up that dubbing a little bit uh, just to tone down the flash a little bit. The head is for profile. The tail is for action. Uh, the tungsten is for the heavy weight that I need up front. That's a four millimeter bead so it can be used in competition. The hook is the best hook on the market, that Umqua hook. That's, everything has a purpose. So anyway, there's my one inch death punch. Uh, I hope you enjoy the fly. Thank you very much. Dude, we're done. Okay. Dude, you're fine. We don't need to do this again. <laughs>